All right, Josh Smith here, live at my studio, Flat 5. Uh, my guest today is someone who has a, a lot of shared experiences with me and a, a yeah, background. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, there was this swell, groundswell of young guitar players playing the blues back in the 90s. It's always been a thing, quite honestly. It's a thing now. Right. It's always been a thing. But there was a grouping of players who came up and Mike was one of them. I'm talking about my guest, Mike Welch, today. Um, I first met Mike in San Jose, California, uh, when we played a double bill at a place called JJ's. But I first heard Mike yeah. uh, absolutely positive on the House of Blues radio show. I'm sure that's the first place I heard you. And I wrote away through Blues Review or Blues Access to buy your record. Uh, oh, wow. Was, Damn. Which was... <laughs> Because I wanted to know the competition, man. I, I bought your record and <laughs> anybody who was my age at the time. You know what right. I mean? I was, oh, no, I, was very I, interested. I, I had one of the Josh Smith and the Rhino Cats records. Believe me, I know what it's like. Exactly. <laughs> so, so, you know, we'll get into your story, but I just want to say Mike is one of the finest blues guitar players on the face of the earth. Oh, man. He has done his homework and knows his shit, but he also listens to other music so while he is a historian and knows his shit, he is not afraid of other music and the great influences right. that it can bring to the blues because, you know, oh, yeah. there's nothing wrong with that. And uh, that's a, a conversation that I've had with a lot of the more blues-based friends that I've been talking to. So we'll get into that. But anyways, Mike, thank you for doing this, man. I, I appreciate you coming. Oh, man, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. This is great. Yeah. So, dude, I've been going over everybody's story with every with every one of the guests. And what's most interesting for me is who comes from a musical family, who had a dad who played or a brother who played or who who just got it completely random. And I actually don't know this about you. So who okay, put the cool. guitar in your hand the first time? Well, I had an older cousin who played. Mm -hmm. Um I was about seven or eight. He was about 13. He played Beatles songs. I thought that was the absolute coolest shit a human being could do. Yeah. So, um, so he gave me this cheap guitar that I think maybe he was, he had just like found somewhere and he was playing on smashing at a gig or something, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was one of these off brand Japanese, uh, didn't have a name tag on it, but I've seen Tysco versions of the same thing, just one pickup. Yeah. And so the first thing I played, I had a book of Beatles songs with the chord shapes written over it. So I remember Twist and Shout, which is the way I could play it back then, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, and then my folks didn't play. My dad is a huge music fan. Um, he had one of those. 60s record collections so yeah. he had all the beatles records which is how that was my end to his record collection i figured he's hip enough to have this right. um but also he was a huge clapton guy everything clapton played on hendrix the stones um you know he's a big dylan guy he talks about when he was a kid feeling ill-adjusted that the free wheel and bob dylan changed his life when it came out you know <laughs> so uh so that was the musical influence. And I was kind of, I was young enough where it was really before any of my school friends had gotten into music. Mm. So pretty much for the first couple of years, my only influence was, you know, all these old classic rock records. And then I was the weird kid who wanted to read the liner notes in the guitar magazines. Yeah. You know? yeah. I mean, well, I, I'm sure I can you relate. had that too. Well, yeah, I can completely relate, especially with, you know, it's it's weird how how young you are when you first actually realize you like certain things about music. Some some kids right. just kind of meander along, and they, it's not that they don't like music, but it never like clicks, and like they don't need to know, oh, who's that, and what's that, and what do you call this, right. and this and that. So yeah, we were so young, and it was the same. My father doesn't play, but he had an enormous vinyl collection of records, and I would look right. at them. And we'd listen to something every day. I mean, we would watch sports right. and listen to records. That's what we did all day. And, mm -hmm. 
So yeah, I would inevitably take that record. Down. He'd you know because he'd he'd go to the record player, put a record on, and the one that was playing, he'd leave the jacket standing upright next to the record player on a little stand, mm. so I could see what was. So That's I'd cool. go pick it up, and I'd look. Oh, it's Hendrix. What's this? You know, or it's the Allman Brothers. Or one time it was Miles Davis, and it's like, wow, this is you know, I I had no idea what I was hearing, but I was automatically right. enthralled. And you're right, it was like. For the next few years before I was talking about music at school with friends, that was what right. I thought all music was. That's just what I heard. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a, uh, my dad also got it really into the idea of going to record stores every week. Nice. <laughs> so, so we go, you know, I'd read about, things in interviews you know i remember going to you know record stores and picking up like little milton records because mm -hmm. i'd read something about little milton or you know uh i don't know i mean all of the great stuff you know that's so, how that's how i heard albert king you know the, all that was stuff. your cousin showing you any stuff or were you just learning out of books and guitar magazines i was learning out of books and guitar magazines and then okay. my mom said that if I was, if I'd been doing it a while and looked I was, like I was serious, she'd pay for lessons. Mm. So I did it for a while. I was serious. And then I took uh, lessons for a while with a guy uh, who worked at a local music store um, who was a great player, kind of like on his own, had almost like a Richard Thompson kind of thing. Oh, cool. Uh, but was also really into the blues and old rock and you know lessons at that point for me were a lot of sitting around jamming mm -hmm. you yeah. know and then getting pointers more than you know more than do this you know yeah i mean and that that also has a great influence on the shape that that we end up following it's like if my first right. teacher would have been a guy that made me sit at this position and put my foot on one of the stands like a classical guitar player and you know just just do only the regimented stuff maybe number one i wouldn't have gotten hooked and maybe number two right i wouldn't have progressed because i probably wouldn't have loved every second of it whereas even though right. the guy was showing me you know the fundamentals he would also go like well what'd you listen to this week and i tell him and he'd teach me something from that or he'd explain right something. exactly talk about what we liked you know and what i what i actually enjoyed right. and that's a key element in getting hooked you know it really and, and, is yeah absolutely yeah so okay so you're listening your dad's got a big record collection you got a guitar you're starting to take lessons you said so that's how you started to learn about little milton or albert king or whatever was through guitar magazines I'm so, assuming? so the, the uh the the crossover point was clapton and hendrix where sure. it went from I want to play songs to suddenly I'm like nerding out about being a guitar player. Mm. You know that distinction? Yeah, <laughs> um, absolutely. So, and I got to say, there's no one in the world better than Eric Clapton at crediting his sources. There was yeah, one right. interview in Guitar Player where basically he outlined my taste in music to this day. It's the first <laughs> time I heard about Otis Rush, Freddie King, little walter ray charles live at newport like he was just talking about all these records yeah. and it was a dan forte interview and dan knows all that stuff too so it kind of felt like these two people talking about all this amazing music just as a given you know what i mean like of course we know what this is right so that's how you know i mean that's probably where i heard about buddy guy first you know yeah yeah no i, I could tell you what yeah like buddy guy i remember definitely from an eric clapton interview in a magazine him saying oh yeah you know, that was when he was he was telling everybody he could at that time oh buddy guy's the greatest guitar player in the world you know what i mean and right i was like oh i should i should have some buddy guy records <laughs> you know right and and that and it was all part of the rituals like i'd find something in a magazine or or the teacher would rec would recommend something and then it's okay dad i need to go to the store and sometimes they wouldn't have it and i'd have to go through that freaking catalog and find oh, something yeah, yeah. for them to order at the record store yeah right but it makes you appreciate it so much more when you finally get your oh ears my god on. i've I, you know i still feel so connected to that music that i heard when i was 10 years old you yep. know uh, in a way that 
it's really hard to recapture with, you know, it's hard to feel that way about music that I hear now. I mean, I really think there is a thing to music being represented by physical objects. You yeah, know, absolutely. You had a record, which was a piece of work rather than a bunch of files on the same device. You check your email and, you know, dick around on social media. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, and, so and you become one of these things was special. Yeah, that's it. It becomes a special thing. It made all these guys even like heroes before I had even known what they were. They, they were like, I was hearing people right. talk about them. I was reading about them. It was an effort to mm -hmm. even get a hold of the music. So by the time I got it, mm -hmm. I had built it up in my mind to like something special. So like Otis Rush, I know it's big for you, Otis Rush. For me, when, when I first actually heard it, I'd seen Stevie talk about Otis Rush. I'd seen uh, right. um, Clapton talk about Otis Rush. I'd seen a picture of mm -hmm. Otis Rush, you know, and, right. and I... And I didn't know exactly what was going on. And my dad didn't have any Otis Rush. And the only one right. I could find was they didn't have any at the new music store. I had to go to a used store. And I found, mm. I think it might have been like a greatest hits Cobra thing. Or it might have been right. morning, morning. I don't know. But uh, I remember getting that tape home and putting it in and feeling like I had found something secret that no, none of my friends knew about this. And most guitar players yeah. probably didn't know about this guy. And this was something special. You know, and it was, yeah, that those moments I mean, are special. For, for me, I can remember, I can remember the thing. I can remember the specific song, specific notes, specific moment. Um, do you have that Albert King Wednesday night in San Francisco? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's like from that same stretch of shows as Blues Power. Yeah, it's um, it's, yeah same tour. <laughs> so I'm sitting on the I'm lying down on the couch, sort of drifting off. I put this record on and, you know, starts, you know, the band kind of plays Watermelon Man or something to bring him on. Yep, he does a shuffle, yep. which is great, but I'm, I'm kind of just absorbing it. And then the third song is a slow blues. Mm -hmm. and, and I hear that and I'm just like, okay, that's what I want to do. Yeah. And that was kind of, for me, the first time I had the idea of, well, maybe I'm a blues guy rather than like a guitar player who's into players who are into the blues. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's funny. I, I don't remember ever thinking that thought like, oh, I should be more blues. It just was like what I liked, I think. And I, I didn't even pay right. attention. And also I, I, I was learning Hendrix stuff and I was learning, you know, right. uh, whatever i was starting to listen to jazz a little bit too and learning some of that stuff and it all just kind of blended together for me it wasn't even like a thought yeah. but then i would talk to other musicians and they would go oh you're a blues guitar player you know you you're that's right. what you're doing you play blues and so i thought oh i guess you're right like i must that must be you know what i what i'm supposed to do but back yeah it was i didn't put a lot of lines between everything that's something right. that comes later when other people start telling you what to do yeah, right. And well, f f there were a couple things. First of all, I think I put that those lines down because I heard Albert King is like, I don't want to do anything else. I want to do what that guy's doing. And that guy's playing yeah. blues. <laughs> and then the other thing is when I did start going out to jams and playing with musicians who were older and knew more and played better than I did. Um, like a lot of the best players I played with were really traditional. Yeah, you know, and that was kind of the scene that I grew up in. Yeah. Um, you know, like a lot of what I learned, you know, the guys in the Blue Tones, Mudcat Ward, the bass player who mm -hmm. played with Big Walter and Hubert and Jimmy Rogers and all these people. Yeah. And, uh, and a big one for me, big mentor was David Maxwell, the piano player. Yeah. Now, with Maxwell. Many, many people. <laughs> well, and, and specifically, the thing you can see is those 70s freddie king videos yeah. yeah you know like the the where freddie's got the lapels out to here and he's doing yeah, the airplane wings the yeah the airplane wings. oh my oh. god it, it's and you know there's this sort of you know and it's a contemporary band for the time but then there's this piano player playing this sort of like otis span meets gospel piano behind it yep and and for a while i did get very hung up on 
the blues as fuck a set of rules <laughs> a manifesto <laughs> well it is and amazing it's, you know because it's oh, like you're it's amazing your circle I, I i think you know a lot of times guitar players who end up having successful careers they of course talk about their biggest influences but sometimes the biggest influences are the guys that are just the ones you're at the gigs with, you know, and no one will right. ever know who they are, but they're the local players you went to see on Wednesday night and who gave you your first right. gig and would give you a little either encouragement or constructive criticism. So, I mean, yeah, there's a whole grouping of people down in Florida that, you know, nobody would know who they were if I said their names, but they had a huge impact right. on the way that I started to approach things. Now you were in a circle with some pretty well-known blues musicians so of course that was gonna start to influence you i mean in boston alone you got right uh what ronnie and ronnie. duke and guys like that traditional blues guitar players yeah. so it's gonna duke influence was you duke was actually living in kentucky when i came up but okay. uh and i didn't meet him until like i was probably about 19 or 20 minutes when i met him but okay you know, like the parallel things in Boston are the sort of early 60s folk revival. Mm -hmm. Like all of that came through Boston. So, you know, you get that. You ever heard that Junior Wells at Club 47 in 66 where he's playing with the yeah. Aces? That's like yeah. down the street, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I mean, there are people around here who used to hang out with Mississippi John Hurt when he came to town. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then also like the Rhode Island, the roomful thing. You know, Duke oh, right, was yeah. huge. And really for the traditional thing for through the 70s, it was pretty much, you know, Duke in, on the East Coast, Jimmy Vaughn down in Texas, and Fat yep. Hollywood Fats on the West Coast. Yep, exactly. And those were the sort of pillars of white guys doing traditional blues. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, which is, you know, I mean, it's complicated. It's a very different thing. <laughs> It is. It um, is. And, you know, and it's a, uh, you know, it's evolved into this weird place we're at now with, you know, this very sharp divide between traditionalists and blues rock and not a lot of room for just someone who loves the blues, but maybe wants to do their own thing. There's not a lot of room for that in the middle anymore, which, which is, is frustrating. You know, to at as, as someone who's both been super traditional and been all over the place stylistically, it's like those line, those stylistic divisions are basically bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. You know? I'm, yeah. I've been dealing with that and my took, whole life. It's a, it's a major, I know, which is insane to me. Yeah. It's, it, the thing that's insane to me is like, there are, you know, there are plenty of players on the scene who are as quote unquote rock as you are. Sure. But because maybe because it's a simpler approach or less stylistically diverse approach, you know, I, I don't know what it is. I, I every time well, I funny, talk like, to you about this, I'm racking my brain. Well, the rock thing is funny why. because I, I would, if, if I were going to slice my, you know, this is stupid, but if I was going to slice myself into a little pie, Rock would be the smallest portion of my pie. You know what I mean? Like, without Yeah, question. you know, and, and that, not, now that you say that, uh, that makes a lot of sense. And, um, but it is, it is weird. Like, for me, it's always just been about f finding my voice, but still having that right. come from a blues background, because to me, that's where my, my center is, you know? Um, right. And it was, it, it took yeah, a lot of, like, me realizing that was okay to like uh, right. there was a time when i thought i can't be a good blues guitar player if i play these other things that i'm hearing or if i work too much on this or if i learn too much of this or whatever and it took a moment right. of like wait a minute that's fucking bullshit like i got uh, right. you know that, that i had to get that out of my mind but it was there was a lot of that in my 20s where it was like i i you know this isn't i'm doing it wrong like yeah I think there's also something about the two of us starting out so young is that maybe there is a little more of that feeling of, am I doing it right? Am I following the rules? Am I doing it? You know, I, I don't know. For me, there was a lot of not wanting to be seen as whatever I thought people were going to see me as. Yeah. 
you know, so like I, you know, if you look at the liner notes to my first record, I'm kind of pretending I hadn't heard all this rock stuff. <laughs> Right, like, right. I, cause I was so into the traditional thing that I was just, it was like punk rockers declaring year zero. Like, you know, yeah. <laughs> this is the way I am. I've always been this. Right. You know? Right. Right. Um, yeah, that's weird. I mean, it is, it's, you're trying to please other people and yourself and like this weird, like picture that you think you're supposed to do. And it's like, eventually right. you realize none of that matters at all you know what's most important is right. just being true to yourself mm -hmm. because like the yeah. guys that we revere that's all they did and they were pushing right. the music forward without even knowing it just by being themselves you know sometimes they did know it you know sometimes well, they yeah, knew yeah, yeah. so I, I like i'm sure you've seen that video of sun house giving Helen wolf shit yes yeah you know, and it's like, you look at Hal and Wolf, and you can't imagine deeper, more real blues than that. Right, right, yeah. But there's Sun House, who's looking at Wolf with his electric band or whatever, and saying, you know, you don't know what this is about, and just like heckling him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, and that's not, that is not blues specific. I mean, you've had that throughout jazz no, and throughout, right? you know, again, every generation eats their young and discourages them yeah, from finding their own thing and yet they do it anyway so, yeah right well okay so you're gigging and you're starting to yeah. find your your way and all that what what did your parents think when it started to become like obvious you're you're not doing anything but this you know you're not going to go to college whatever this is this is life what, what did they think i'm curious about that okay so my parents had a very explicitly stated deal they made with me that I had to get grades and test scores good enough to get into college, whether I wanted to go to college or not, that I couldn't drink or do drugs and that I couldn't become a self-important asshole. <laughs> if I broke any of those rules, they're like, they were like, we'll pull the plug. It's more important to us that you become a human being at the other end of this than right. a famous guitar player. Um, and, you know, the, I think the last one was the hardest promise to keep because I was a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> I've probably said some things that I, I regret now. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but, and then beyond that, it's like my, my mom managed my career for the first few years. My dad would come on the road because I couldn't get into clubs without. Of course, yeah. You know. And, so, I mean, you know, we had to put on the show of it being a very benign situation where, you know, of course it's protected and I'm not going to be causing trouble. And, you know, so, uh, yeah. it's, it's that weird thing, you know, that um, the only place, uh, the only place you can really do what we wanted to do is in bars. Oh, yeah. You know, there aren't, you know, there aren't school ensembles playing you know, Freddie King tunes or whatever, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a sax player. I know who the joke was, you know, when I would come out to jams at 11 years old, you go, keep them off the streets and in the saloons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, and it takes a special kind of parent to be cool with that and not only be cool with it to encourage it because, I guess, right. you know, I guess they trust their own parenting skills. They trust the person right. that this kid is becoming and them to be follow the right path. And they believe in them enough to, to think, you know, this yeah. is a real thing and not belittle it. And that takes a special kind of parent, you know, and we're sounds like we're both and incredibly fortunate. Incredibly fortunate um, in all respects, both the support and the sort of realism behind that support you know mm -hmm. yes um you know my parents were never stage parents they yeah. saw their role as protective not not promotional right yeah. um and and i'm eternally grateful to that because you know i i made it out intact right yeah and and they held you accountable like you said you had to get the good enough grades yeah. 
you had to be a good person. You, you couldn't, you know, drink and drive. I mean, that's very much similar to the deal that I struck, you know, without even knowing it with my parents. You well, know, I was, was going like, to say that, that you've had that experience also with your own son of, you that know, too, yeah. of, of, uh, you know, a uh, child going into an adult working situation where, absolutely, you know, the, it's not natural for a kid to be praised by adults in that way. Yeah. Constantly. It was so interesting there's... when that started to happen for my son, Riley, uh, you know, he, he's an actor for people who don't know. Um, but, and he started to have success. I was kind of, you know, the dissenter, not wanting him to do it, at least initially. Uh, I wasn't I can understand the that. idea. And, but he made it clear to me how much he enjoyed it. And I could see how much work he was putting into already at a young age, the craft. Like he liked learning how to act, learning his lines, doing the job. And it became like crystal clear to me, Jesus, what a hypocrite I would be if I didn't think right. he would know something already that he loves and wants to do when I'm the ultimate case of that same exact thing. Like I found and loved what I wanted to do like at the same little age. And my parents supported me. So it was like, Oh yeah, yep. I got to get on the bandwagon. Right, absolutely. You know, yeah. um, you know my my kid is, you know, get is involved in theater and singing their ass yeah. off and acting, and they've got a th teen run theater company they're doing, and it's just I watch what what they're doing, and it's not that far off from what I did. Right. You yeah. know, even yeah. though the, the you know, the product is different. The art form is different. It's still, I, I watch it and it's like, yeah, this is, this is a kid who knows what they want yep. and who's yep. very smart about the art they're creating. Yep. Yeah. That's, it's a cool thought, you know, to think that not everybody gets lucky enough to find something they love and just go towards that right. goal. Some people go their entire life without it at all. You know, finding that thing they want to dedicate yeah, I, their life to. I, I would have been completely insane. I would have gone completely insane if I hadn't found if I hadn't found this. Yeah, same. Same here. Because the only other thing I want to do is play second base for the Yankees, but I sucked. Right. So it was like I had, there was no, yeah, there was nothing else right. I could have. And, and if you think there aren't a lot of gigs, there certainly aren't a lot of second baseman slots open to the Yankees. Exactly. Even if exactly. you get good enough, you know. Yeah. yeah. Also, just for, for everybody, I, I, I always think it's amazing. And it's not just us. How many guitar players have kids and the name Riley is a part of their kids? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, JQ's middle name is Riley. Yeah. yeah well, you know, I mean, Riley. how much, you know, how much, how much is BB the shining example of what we all want to be when we grow up? Well, it was, I mean, I'm, you got to spend time with him. I got to spend time with him. It wasn't even, yes, it was the music. I mean, he was my biggest hero initially as a kid, but it was, mm. it was when I got to be around it, it was, yeah. Oh my God. I oh want, my. I just want to be that yeah. guy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, I, you know, I only, I, I mean, I only really spent 45 minutes with him and I feel like I'm a better person for those 45 minutes. <laughs> I'm with you, you know, I'm with you. as, yeah. as weird as that sounds, it feels like, yeah, no, that made me a better person. Yeah. Um, Dude, so, so when you started putting out the records and getting mm -hmm. out on the road, was that feeling just like, like you knew, like this was it, right? This is, this is what you're supposed to do for the rest of your life. There's, there's some oh, special yeah. moment. Yeah. I, I, no, and I think the way I made everything make sense in my head, you know, all this absurd shit that was happening was exactly that. It was, oh, of course I'm doing this because if it wasn't this, I wouldn't have a chance to play, you know, and I've got to play. So this is how I do it. Yeah. Did you at any point during that early stages uh, have any playing experience or just you know, experiences with people your age at all? Were there any friends that played that you would get together with or anything like that? I had, I had some friends. I played bass in a band in uh, high school at the same time I was going out and touring. 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, I played bass in this band that would do like Smokey Robinson tunes and Beatles tunes and like all this, all this stuff. And it was, it was a nice break yeah. from, you know, high school was a big thing for me because uh, Lexington Mass, where I grew up, had this incredible jazz program with a great teacher. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wasn't, you know, I would take the improv classes that the teacher had, but I also had my own career. So I wasn't in the combo or whatever that the high school had. Yeah. Um, but there was still, there was a room in the high school where like Thelonious Monk records and Love Supreme were always playing and people were talking about music. Yeah. Um, and then I had one friend who was really into the Beatles which was my first love, but I'd sort of given that up when I became more of a traditional blues guy. Right. And then I had another friend who, you know, was all about Motown and Stevie Wonder and Stax. Well, that's so cool. like that became my circle of people and sort of my mind opened up at that point. Um, yeah. You know. Well, that, that's cool that you had I could play guys. them Elmar James records, you know. Really? But, oh yeah. Because you know, if if you're if you have friends who are into like soul music and the Beatles, like you can sort of and and are and are nerds who like talking about music all the time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, you can. It sort of became this cool thing where we're all discovering each other's old music. Well, yeah, and that's cool that you did get to have some friends your age that were playing something, you know, and you got to hang around yeah. with. That was always difficult for me to find guys my age. You know, I had yeah. music at school too, but nobody cared about any of the music I liked. And it was like they weren't even listening to Beatles or Motown. It was right. only metal or grunge, you know, and that was that was all that was going on then. And right. it was yeah, so it was difficult to find people my age to even, you know, if even if they were good and had been playing they had no interest in talking with, with me about the stuff I was interested in. So that, that was different. Right. Yeah. And I think the, part of, part of it is, is the friends I had, you know, like, I mean, yeah, they played, but we sort of, we were fans together more than we were players together. Mm-hmm. Which I, some, I think sometimes it's important to remember to be a fan. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm still that way. Now it's like when I listen to music, I'm even even when I'm working on something, I'm listening as a fan. I try to actually like turn that part of my brain on on purpose. Like when I put music right. on, I don't want to mm-hmm. be thinking about it from you know studying it or I got a job to do or no, I just want to listen to it <laughs> like a regular person. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and some of my favorite music is stuff that I've never even dreamed about sitting down and learning how to play. Yeah, ab- same, same, absolutely. Yeah. And, and just, just, I'm curious, you know, as you got to be an adult, right. You, when you finally mm-hmm. pass 21 and you could go anywhere you want by yourself now without your parents and you're, you know, you're becoming mm-hmm. like an adult. Cause I, I know this same transition for me. When, when did you start to feel like people change their attitude towards you? Cause I was always waiting for that moment when like, <laughs> they didn't. Think, they didn't feel like there was I, a narc I, in the room. You know what I mean? I, 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 I don't know. I mean, I. I always felt like a narc. I, feel, I felt like they were looking at me, like they they couldn't be themselves around me, and I was yeah, so I, waiting I, for I, that to change. I, I I felt I feel lucky that I didn't really have that feeling, <laughs> um, but I'm still waiting for. You know, I still waiting for the feeling of not being told how young I look when I get off stage. It's like I'm over forty years old. Same. You know, yeah. my beard's almost half white. You know. Yeah. Um. Yeah. But uh, that un- unfortunately, for me, some of it. That's never going um, away, man. It's never going away. Right. Everything right. I release well, or post or any gig I play, there'll be one person who comments. Or is there or something and we'll say, I saw you in and you had on this hat and you look like this and blah, 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 blah. Oh, my God. So, so you, I swear more people come up to me and say they saw me when I was 12 in Boston 
yeah. than were at any of those shows. Like, yeah, I where were you? Shows. I would have been a fucking millionaire yeah. by now if that was true. <laughs> there's a, you know, there's a couple legendary like Boston, you know, sort of uh, punk and new wave shows, like when the police came down and played the Rat in 1970, whatever, and you know, the joke is how many people were say they were there. Yeah. You know. And the place holds, you know, how many people. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. So. All right, cool. Well, dude, let's get into the uh, 10 questions. Sure. All right, number one. When you started playing for the first time, right, what was the first thing that when you got it under your fingers, maybe it was Swiss and Shout, like you just said, that when you learned it, it was like, oh, my God, you know, I got this. No going back now. The hook is set. I think it was probably Twist and Shout. Yeah. There was also, there was some, and I can't remember what it was. There was something with a riff. It may have been Come Together, but that was the first time. I probably wasn't even playing it like that, but I'd figured right. out the notes. It was the first thing I played that wasn't just, you know, <laughs> it wasn't just like putting my fingers in the shape in the box and, you know, right. bashing away at it. And how did you, how did you learn come together then? Did somebody show you or did it just, you just found it? Um, Cause I'm assuming you weren't reading so tabs of it. I wasn't reading tabs of it. Um, I actually would. So the record player was in the living room and then all my guitar stuff was relegated to the basement. Mm -hmm. um, uh, which I totally understand because I was way too loud. Um, uh but I remember like stopping the record, humming the notes in my head, running downstairs. Ah. I like, I, I, it sounds insane. It sounds like I'm making it up, but yeah, I, I actually remember running back and forth up and downstairs. Wow. But that's the shit that we do when you get obsessed with something. It's like you can't oh, yeah. help but do it. Yeah. 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 That's cool, man. All right. So then what, what then moving forward is the first solo that you ever like felt so connected to, you needed to learn it note for note. Like what was a solo that you just had to learn? I didn't learn solos note for note. Ever? Not even one? I, okay. So I had, my attention span was a joke. It still is. So I would learn the first lick and then i would like okay so uh sunshine of your love he starts with the blue moon quote and then he goes yeah. down here to play something yeah. you know and then i would noodle around down there and then when it goes to the four but i never learned it i would just like i'll noodle around here you know, I'll play the one lick I know, then I'll noodle around here, then I'll, you know. Um, and even, I think later on I would learn solos as an exercise, like transcribing, mm -hmm. because I knew I had a lot of gaps. But, um, but even like later when I started soloing all the time, it wasn't so much, you know, the solo starts here and ends here as Albert King does this. T-Bone Walker does this. Yeah. You know, and I would sort of learn these things and figure out how to put them together. And some of it, some of it is that I listened to this stuff so much that I probably did end up playing some stuff note for note that I didn't even realize I'd learned note for note. Yeah, that's exactly it. Like even... Even, you know, solos that I didn't ever, ever sit down and play note for note, I could recall them now and probably play them fairly close to note for note just because of the sheer right. amount of times I've listened to them and because they reside yep. in here. Yeah, absolutely. 
uh, yeah, no, there are definitely records that I can play back in my head and hear them just as clearly as if I put them on headphones. Yeah, absolutely. It's like, yeah, if I listen to Blues Power, I could play every one of those choruses, note for note, probably right now. Right. And certainly Stevie, almost any solo. Hendrix, almost any song. You know, like, even if I haven't even learned that solo ever, it, it, it's in right. there. It'll come out. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, All I right. mean, the, the Stevie thing's funny for me because I that was one of the ones where – you know, I got into Stevie a little bit after the Clapton and Hendrix and all that, because right. my guitar teacher said, if you like all this, you should hear Stevie Ray Vaughan. Mm -hmm. And then I saw Stevie Ray Vaughan, <laughs> which, you know, messed me up pretty hard. What's the first thing you saw? Um, Clapton. Uh, I mean, apart from things like my cousin's band playing small No, 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 of, of Stevie. What was the first thing you saw of, of Stevie? Oh, the first thing I saw was him live. Oh, you did? It was. I didn't know this. I saw him live, yeah. Um, the Jeff Beck tour then? A, no, it was after. Can't have been after. It was summer of 89, I'm pretty sure. Um, it so was you're like a, nine years it, old. It, yeah, it was a, a 10 probably because summer. Yeah. Um, it was a blues festival where... Ronnie Earl was the MC. I didn't know anything about him. Uh, Johnny Winter was on it. Uh, John Mayall was on it with Coco Montoya. Mm -hmm. uh, and I still, I still, every time I see Coco, I tell him about, because uh, he had a rented Marshall 412. And at one point during the set, a completely circular fire erupts at one corner of the 412. Because <laughs> one of the cones had just lit up. And I finally got a chance to say, hey, the first time I saw you was Mayall in the 80s. He's like, man, Stevie gave me shit about that for the rest of his life. <laughs> but, and then Stevie was the headliner. And, you know, I didn't really know his records at that point. Right. But, like, I knew about the blues and I knew about Hendrix and I knew enough to know how good Stevie was and and it was you know it was huge I mean that's the only the only way I can describe it is in terms of size the sound the yeah. presence it was just there was a hugeness to it yeah. um, that wasn't just volume it was something big going on um and then, you know, I got so hung up on not wanting to be seen as a Stevie clone. Yeah. That I poisoned myself. I couldn't listen to Stevie for a long time. I convinced myself I didn't like him all that much. Right. Because I was yeah. a kid and I was a fucking idiot. And I wish I hadn't done that. Well, I mean, there's, you know, there was backlash even when he was still alive in the blues world. But oh, then yeah. when he passed, because of the amount of clones that you know myself included that came from that those ashes yeah then the backlash yeah. got severe so there was a a, a a major like pushback where everybody would make mm -hmm. conscious decisions oh i'm not going to play a strat i'm not going to do that you know right like i'm I, I can't you know and yeah it was weird weird times i mean it it, it was weird and I mean, I think Ron Earl really replaced Stevie for me as the kind of like hyper intense, yeah. you know. Well, that was what, what yeah, for me, hero. besides the playing, it was the intensity. So I didn't get to see him live, and I'm super jealous that you got to see him. But when I first saw him, he was good. You should have checked him leg. out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> when I first saw the bootleg, just a bootleg of, you know, video of it finally. That was the thing that stood out because I had already heard some music, but it was like seeing it and the, the sweat mm -hmm. and the energy and the, you know, the effort was like, oh, I want to do that. Like that's that weird combination of, of like, obviously a lot of effort and energy, but also completely relaxed and fluid. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, the, I think you and I may have talked about this, uh, that, performance from new orleans where he's playing with albert collins and then with albert and bb uh-huh 
that was just on TV and my dad taped it because he was flipping through channels and saw Stevie Ray Vaughan and I saw it the next morning. Yeah. yeah and it was that, on like that VH1 shuffle does, or MTV or something like that. Yeah. I I I remember the well, the station ID in this corner being like CBS or something. Oh, really? They were just doing like highlights from the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival or whatever it was. What's funny is Matt and, Schofield said the same thing. He said his dad taped it. He would leave a tape in the VCR for moments like that. And he said his dad mm -hmm. had moved to America and taped it off TV here. And then when Matt came to visit him, Matt, he showed him that tape. That's so you know, funny. Holy cow. You know? Yeah. yeah. Um, but that shuffle with Albert Collins is still some of my favorite Stevie stuff ever. Oh, yeah. And, it, man, it's crazy when they're all up there. It's like, you know, they're all in <laughs> – BB's in standard – and Stevie's playing half step down, and Albert Collins is in right. F minor with a cable. F minor, you know? yeah, and it's like yeah, so it's like so cool. they, I, I I think it ends up where Stevie's on the third fret, uh, Albert's on the second, and BB's on the fourth, something yeah, like that. Exactly, yeah, exactly. BB, okay, so the BB plays a lick on there that I never heard him do uh, anywhere else, but anytime I play BB, it happens. <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 yep um, yep that was a good one katie webster too was on that <laughs> oh yeah katie webster oh my god yep yeah and it's just uh, you know i know there's and more sometimes, there's got to be an unedited version of all there, there's got to be think other i've stuff. seen a clip i've seen a clip of life without you because i think mm. double trouble did a set and then brought up guests yeah yeah yeah. Stevie's kind of in the puffy pirate shirt, white pirate yeah, the shirt. the white shirt and the hat with yeah. the tail. And the, yeah, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, crazy. All right, number three. What's the first thing you play when you pick up a guitar every time? Do your hands go somewhere or do you not have something like that? Oh, I, I, it's, I end up some some degree of... You know, it's a, uh, and there are some things that will happen. Like I can't even think of, but there are things that I only play when I'm noodling and mm -hmm. I can't think of other stuff to play that actually don't show up in my real playing when I'm playing right. songs. Yeah. Is it G a lot of the time? Uh, actually, it doesn't matter. It's whatever my hand's nearest. <laughs> I was like I was like D because it's middle of the neck and everything's real loose, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. Um. Yeah. yeah was, what so, about like uh, if you're? What about if you go into a music store, and you want to see you know try out a guitar and see if it has you know something you like? Is there a thing you play that lets you know if the guitar is comfortable or works for you? Well, I think starting out all of the bending and because that's such a huge part of what I do. Yeah. That if a guitar is stiff in that way, then I'm not going to have fun playing it. You know, um, yeah. unless it's a guitar that would be used for specific things. Sure. You know, like I, there are guitars I think of kind of as special effects guitars because yeah, they don't really do what I do. But, but there's no way to get that sound without them. Yeah. You know? yeah. Like I, I'd like to have a really nice jazz box with flats on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You absolutely. know, um, and I probably wouldn't, you know, probably wouldn't expect to do Albert King men's on that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> probably not. <laughs> Although, uh, I went to Dick Sherman's house and he has like a 60 super 400, which uh -huh. has like nines on it. He said, because Fenton Robinson told him, no, you just put blue strings on it. <laughs> yep. yeah. You know, you want to bend it, just put blue strings. You can have your jazz strings on some of them, but some of you put blue strings on. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, dude, do you have a, like, 
musical narrative that runs through your head a lot of times like if you're driving around or cooking or something i'm hearing a shuffle in b flat even kind of right now while we're talking it never honestly goes all the way away i'm hearing some sort of yeah. it never goes away and i'm wondering do you have something that like that that comes and goes or I think that slow blues definitely happens. Um, I think a lot, the other thing I play when I pick up a guitar uh, is Robert Johnson. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of times that's what's going through my head is that or something at that tempo like you know yeah. robert nighthawk or jimmy rogers or you know something that's raw but still has that kind of gentle lilt to it you know what i mean yeah that mid-tempo you know hump or whatever it's such yeah. a, that tempo is a magic tempo because it's like it lives between it really is slow and 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 up it's like yeah i could see that and getting it, stuck in my head and being there all yeah, the time. Yeah, and, and it is something that if, you know, you know, if, if it's counted in faster or slower than you're feeling it, you know, it's, it's hard to find center if it's not quite right. Yeah, yeah. It's weird, like, that. that there's that tempo where a shuffle is a slow blues still, you know what I mean? Or vice versa. Right. And I love playing that tempo. <laughs> well, you know, a lot of it depends on, are you thinking in triplets? Oh, yeah. Are you course. thinking in eighth notes? Are you thinking in quarter notes? Yep. You know, because, you know, to me, like the T-bone medium slow blues, it's hard, very hard for me to play if the drummer's doing da 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 you know. Yeah, you're right. Because all that double time stuff doesn't really work that great over heavy cymbal trips. <laughs> Yep. Um, so subdivisions are hugely important where you feel that, yep. you know, do you feel a shuffle as just the first and third beats of a triplet? You know, some people do. And it's that very kind of almost mechanical thing. Yep. Some people that, uh, eighth note is just right up on the edge of the next quarter note. Um, you know, like the difference between the way Sonny Freeman would shuffle behind BB King, da 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 da, da. or yeah, you know, more, well he da, was coming from da, da. you know, Sonny. See, Sonny Freeman is a really good one because he's a, to me a complete extension of what jazz guys were doing in the transition, like between Houston. big band Dixieland and stuff into you know Houston. Yeah. Houston is the key to that whole thing. All those Memphis musicians. You know, uh, all the people that Gatemouth played with, all the people who went through Bobby Bland's band, you know, like the drummers with Bobby with Bobby Bland, it's like, you know, Sonny Freeman and then Jabbo Starks, Jabbo Starks, which yeah. becomes funk, you yeah. know. But all the well, Houston guys, like Clarence Holloman, Wayne Bennett, those guys, you know, it was a point of pride that they could do the rawest down most down home dirty blues gig they could play with lightning hopkins and then if frank sinatra came to town and right. needed a pickup guitar player they could do that gig yeah you know well yeah you're right you're right and and these guys i mean they took pride in in that diversity that they had even though you know right from an outsider's perspective it's similar music and related it was totally different right. worlds especially between like raw blues and some big band you know what i mean so yeah yeah and sonny freeman um, i would always to me i'm always hearing art blakey when i hear sonny freeman the way Art blakey would yep, play a shuffle with no downbeat you know dun, 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 dun. Yep. and yeah yeah um when did you feel like you know and, and this is tough coming i know this feeling having started so young 
when did you feel like you started to find your voice? Like, was there a moment that something clicked and you felt like I should go further this path because it's starting to become like my thing? I feel like I've had moments where that comes and goes. Um, I, I feel like I sort of had my own version of things back when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, as the sort of stylistic range of what I wanted to do got wider, you know, I feel like I lost some of the focus. And then I took a break from doing my own thing and joined Sugar Ray and the Blue Tones for a long time. And I actually joined the Blue Tones twice. I was in that band for a couple years. Then I left. Then a few years later, I went back into the band. And mm. the thing about the Blue Tones is that's a band that was formed by Sugar Ray Northia and Ronnie Earl. And then Kid Bangham had been the guitar player between Ronnie and me. And those were both huge influences on me. Yeah. And I was kind of self-conscious about, you know, am I playing too much like Ronnie or Kid? Or am I, do I feel like a cover band in my own band? Like, you know, like I'm <laughs> playing in a cover band? Um, yeah. So for a while, the way I reacted to that is I got super traditional. You know, I got really into not playing the sort of more modern version of whatever it was um and then i took a break made some of my own records played with a lot of different people and when i came back into the blue tones about 2008 or so i kind of realized okay well i'm just gonna play the way i play and you know sometimes that will you know um, the influences are always going to come through because that's the kind of musician I am. Like, I I don't think you're ever not going to hear the influences in what I do. But um, instead of worrying about how, you know, how it would have been appropriate for someone to play this in the 50s, I'm going <laughs> to play the way I play with, with bent notes and tons of vibrato and, like, my own yeah. phrasing and and not have to put on a costume every time a song starts. Yeah. And that's, I mean, the, you, that's a big part of it right there is like feeling okay to, even if you're playing traditional, it could have been any style, you know, it, even if I'm right. playing bebop or something, not feeling like I have to just pretend that I'm Wes Montgomery, that I could just no, be me. When, but it, when, certainly when West Montgomery. When you play jazz, it sounds like you. Right. When you play jazz to me, it, it sounds like you. Yeah, yeah. And I you're want playing in that. Down, you're like me. You're you know? playing in that bag, and you've got that tone, and you're playing those ideas. But it's like the, you know, I mean, you know how it is when. I don't. I mean, maybe maybe it's different for you, but I I would guess that it's not. When I hear guitar players, I don't hear strings and frets and pedals. Mm. I don't see finger positions. I just mm. hear someone's voice coming out. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's you know. the hope, at least, you know. Well, even even if it's, um, yeah, even if it's someone who's not original, it's like, I, you know, like I sort of, it's the guitar sound, which is the person. And, you know, it's only when I sit down later that I'm like, oh, they must have done it like this. Or, sure. Yeah. You know, um, yep. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's also, you know, we're, we live in an improvisational world. So, I mean, we're yeah. hearing people, even when they're copying their favorite people, they're still, they're still improving, you know? So it's like, right. There's variance no matter what, but yeah. yeah. And sometimes the improv, I mean, the funny thing is sometimes the improv isn't even about notes. It's how much weight you give some notes in a phrase oh, might yeah. be different from one night to the next, you well, know, certainly because uh, how much you're leading into the beat. Well, you're reacting to what's going on in the musicians around you. You're reacting to what's going on in the audience, you know, whether right. they're fucking paying attention or not or whatever, you know, right. what, what all those things are factors in the way you play that night that will make it yep. different than the night following, which is, that's the best part. Yeah. Yeah. That's right, the cool. other thing you touched on too. It's, you know, 
reacting and playing conversationally with other musicians. Yeah. You know, that's huge for me. That's, that's my favorite thing. That's what we're missing right now. <laughs> what? Oh my God. I've been putting together all these tracks with like, you know, I've got, you know, I'll spend a week editing a drum loop until it feels like an actual drummer with fills and like, yeah. you know, you're talking about subdivisions is like, where do I want this shuffle to sit? And yeah. then my bass playing has gotten a lot better during the pandemic <laughs> uh-huh. <Nice. laughs> because I'm the one playing bass on all these things I'm recording, Yep. yep. you know, and it's, um, you know, I'm glad I have that skill set, but it'd be really nice to have someone else do some of that work for me. Oh, yeah, because then you go and blow over it, and you know exactly right. what's going to happen at every moment. Right. Well, <laughs> I, I, and, and I've built in spontaneity is the funny yeah, thing. exactly. Like, yeah. I've built in accents that I know, like, I'm going to play over later as if I'm cueing the band. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> at 2.16, here comes that, oh, there's, there's excitement at 2.16. Yeah, I, I recorded a slow blues where there's literally a, you know, in a quiet section, there's literally a pretzel crack as if I had done this. Yeah. <laughs> Cause that's the way the music I sat. I, I like was talking to, you know? I was, I was last night where I was talking to Matt Schofield interviewing him for the same thing. And he was talking about yeah. how he's just sitting at home playing and it's like, well, dude, the dynamics is the biggest thing. You're never going to sit here by yourself and go from playing two right <laughs> like, like let me bring it down and hunch over and act like i'm on a gig you know like right it's gone that's just and gone. then things are gonna Nothing get like really it. crazy and i'm gonna put it behind my head yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know there's someone on their couch practicing behind their head right now absolutely absolutely yeah <laughs> oh dude number six what do you feel okay. is your biggest weakness on the guitar Oh, well, this goes back to um, talking about playing conversationally. I've got a really good reactive sense of time. Yeah. Like I can lock in with people pretty hardcore. The mm-hmm. second I have to do an unaccompanied intro or a breakdown, that just goes right to shit. Really? Like my, my internal clock. And I've been surprised. Like I've recorded things like playing solo and, and I'll realize, oh, that's actually pretty much in time. But like my arms, like my elbows seize up. I get really uncomfortable. Um, I really like playing off of existing time. People don't realize it's actually harder those moments on the gig than it is in the studio because on the gig, oh, yeah. you're, you're juiced up. And you're looking out at the people, you're looking at your friends, and then all of a sudden, either you're starting a song, or yeah, people drop away, and there's this moment that's just you for a while, and you've right. been in the zone, not thinking, and then all of a sudden, it's like, oh, right. fuck, I'm the foundation, too, now. You know what right. I mean? And th- yeah. the thing is, in the studio, you can punch it in. Yeah, and you can have a <laughs> click, you know? Yeah. 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 Um, oh, that's interesting, man. That's interesting. I mean, there have been times where th- there have been times where, you know, someone will say, "Hey, do you want to do a gig?" And I don't say it out loud, but I, in my head, I'm like, "If I can have a click track, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> then I can nail it." <laughs> yeah. Do you do you naturally drag or or rush? Drag. Okay. It used yeah. to be rush, and then I worked so hard on not rushing. Um. You know, uh, a lot of the traditional guys play so far behind the beat. So far. You know, like Mudcat Ward is a perfect example. If you record him into Pro Tools consistently, he's about 40 milliseconds behind. Mm. He's in time. It's just he hits the bass later. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that's why uh, one of the reasons when I heard Voodoo, it messed me up so hardcore. Because it was like, oh, it's a record where they're all doing that Muddy Waters band thing of who can play this slower than the rest of them and be in time. With my little personal insight into that from having played with Raphael so long, he he jokes about it all the time, how they were they were almost fucking around to some of it to see how far I've heard that story. Yeah. 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 And it was like, oh, let me see how far back I could put this bass, you know? Yeah. Yeah. 
people don't realize quest love is pretty straight actually on most of that stuff oh yeah it's the base it, is just so far back <laughs> on and on some of it uh i mean it's never it's never ahead but on some of it it's almost kind of square yeah. you know it's like a little angular and everyone else is sort of yep. behind yep. it yeah but yeah they were i remember what when that record came out i was doing a session and uh and i brought it in to play uh i played the engineer feel like making love he's like they pro tools those group vocals right because there's no way they did that behind and i'm like no that's just the way that's just the way they feel it you know that's the way he feels it not only is because that he was like there's no way you could consistently get it exactly that behind not only is that tape it's this machine sitting right here in my studio damn that i got from Raphael. that's pretty cool yeah <laughs> so yeah that's that cool. must have been such an education Oh, yeah, because it was a new world for me. You know, he brought me in yeah. when he started doing more Motown and Stax, which is, I, I know that stuff really well. So that was, right. Yeah, that's why he brought me in. But I remember, then, then I remember we, seeing you on TV with him, and it was, a, a lot of it was straight up early 60s. Yeah, yeah. You know, that was the vibe. Yeah, but then on the gigs, I had to know Tony, 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 and d'angelo and you know the songs he'd written right. for other people and that that side of his cat so that was new stuff for me to work on and i that was really enjoyable that's great yeah. yeah it was a good gig who who's a huge influence on your playing that people would be like really surprised to hear the one that used to seem to surprise people although i know you're not going to be surprised at all it's Robert Cray. Okay, yeah. Not, yeah, not a surprise to me. I mean, yeah, yeah it, it, I mean, uh, I, like, I say that, and you know exactly the stuff I took from Robert Cray. Sure. But, um, you know, a lot of the things that people think are Otis Rush in my playing are actually Cray. Um, I can hear that. You know, because, like, the... You know, his vibrato is even wider and weirder than Otis's sometimes. Oh, his vibrato is really, really and, unique. Yeah. And it's also, it's not just one vibrato. You know, sometimes it's... And sometimes, you know... <laughs> yep. yep. Um, like, there was... At the... Well, and you bender, hear it... You hear it so clear. His tone is so fucking clean that right. it's like... You can, and I think it that's, registers very fast that vibrato. I, I think I think that's one of the one of the reasons some people don't hear Cray in my playing. Um, I tell them, you know, if I were playing a Strat on two and four, that's yeah. all you'd hear. Yeah, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, but there was uh, at the Blues Bender last year. Cray was on that gig, mm -hmm. and I was standing at the side of the stage. I don't know him. He doesn't know me. Um, but if it had been a friend of mine doing those solos at that gig, I would have thought that dude's making fun of me because <laughs> it was like comically all the stuff I've stolen from him. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, he doesn't know me, but, but it was like, yeah, okay. I, I owe that guy a check. Nice. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, I mean, there's some, there's some people, um, who you can't hear them in my playing, but they're always in my head. Prince is probably the biggest one. Yeah. So people may be surprised like, to hear that. Um, yeah. I mean, like it's a huge influence on me. Also the influence for me that Prince had was breaking me out of preconceived notions. Um, because especially when I was starting to get out of being the traditional blues guy, um, a lot of what he did just as a guitar player, a lot of it sounds that I wasn't into, mm. you know, like hyper-processed, yeah. you know, boss pedals, a lot of notes, you know, all this stuff that was not my thing, but his voice and his freedom was so powerful 
that it allowed me to start listening to music past what some of the things that might have prejudiced me against it. Like I can hear players who have the kind of tones I wouldn't ordinarily be into. And if they're owning it now, I'm like, great. Yeah. yeah. And just, you know, like I said, the freedom. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a good, I mean, Prince is, you know, he's Prince, no explanation needed for me. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, he's, yeah. And, and that's, that's one, like I say that and, and I know you know exactly what I'm talking about. He's, but yeah. Yeah, the, the blues guy w w will go, well, I don't hear any of that in your playing. So, you know, I don't get it, you know. Yeah. And then a lot of my melodic shit is because I grew up listening to the Beatles. Oh, you know, yeah. My yeah. my playing gets very sing-songy. Um, uh, my, I really like beginnings, middles, and ends, even on longer solos, mm -hmm. you know. Um, when I... You know, I always hate that thing when you're playing with the singer and you're about to finish up the solo, like clearly about to put a point on it. And then the singer's like, more, more, keep going. It's yeah. like, dude, did you, you know, I just wrapped not this listen? shit up. I just finished. I yeah. just, you know, I, I said good day, sir. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I put, I was putting the bow on it right now. You know, like, right. Can't you hear that? Yeah. yeah. Right. Ugh. Dude, would you, would you rather have, on a gig situation, a great guitar mm -hmm. and a shitty amp, or vice versa, a great amp and a bad guitar. I've spent most of my career playing my highest profile gigs on shitty amps overseas. Yeah. So I know how to do shitty amp. Mm -hmm. um, uh, shitty guitar, it would depend on like if it's a playable guitar that doesn't sound great. Yeah, playable. Yeah. Like, but you know, not actively working against me. I don't know. Right. Yeah. You know, but I've I've played through some busted ass silver face twins. You know, in my day, <laughs> it's always a busted. One hundred thirty five watts. Twins. One, yeah. one. You know, one of the JBL sounds asthmatic. You know, it's yeah. like. Yeah. 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 Uh. So, so I have more experience with a guitar I like and a shitty amp. Sometimes it feels like half the silver faces in the world ended up in Europe. I don't know how that's possible, but it's weird. Yeah, yeah. All right, so I'm, I would rather have the amp than the guitar. I'm the opposite. <laughs> I'll take the I, crappiest I, I guitar think... and be more comfortable with a tone that even approximates what I like. Then, then vice versa. I could have this guitar and play, you yeah. know, if I, if I had to plug into some, a JC-120 or something without my pedals and just no chance, no chance. I've, I got away with it with JC-120 at one point um, at a huge gig. And it was super clean, but there was something cool about it. And... For, for whatever reason, it was like compressing a little and giving. It wasn't just that hard, like, rick at the beginning of every yeah. note. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, when I discovered pedals, because it took me a long time to, to become a guy who was into the idea of using pedals, it just made my life so much easier. Yeah. yeah. You know? I, I, I could I could start looking I could start looking at amps as a canvas, as opposed to if this amp doesn't break up, you're screwed. You know, yeah, then I'm fucked. Yeah. Yeah. Well, all right. All right. Well, this one that answer has been split down the middle, basically. With everything. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. What? Uh, I mean, what Actually, no. I've got a better answer. I've got a better answer. Can I sub out the gig? I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I only want to do the gigs where I can have all of my gear. Yeah. Oh. That would be, be nice. Like, be like one day. Be like a Eric Johnson showing up with, you know. Oh yeah. I mean, imagine him having to play his gig 
through a JC120, you know, with a fuzz face and like forget even with his pedal board, <laughs> he'd be screwed. You know, it just wouldn't happen. Right. I interviewed Tosa Nabasi two nights ago. And oh it's wow, like, yeah. yeah. He can't do his gig without an eight string fan fret guitar. You know what I mean? It's not possible. Yeah, there's. Yeah, there's there's no like getting a music store to loan you a telly while while they're fixing you. You know. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, dude, what keeps you like? I know the pandemic is odd times, but what keeps you wanting to learn new things and keeps you pushing forward, trying to be a better musician? Because we all know guys, especially I'm curious about this with you. We've all seen guys that we watched, you know, as kids who are the age we are now then. Right. And now we see them now and they, they don't have it anymore and they never progressed any further. They just stopped at some certain spot and maybe they can't even really mm-hmm. play now anymore. And that was an obsession. for Yeah. Me. You know, a- a- aging is a thing. Um, I feel like. I'm curious to see what the post pandemic world looks like, because for me, it was always surrounding myself with players who knew things I didn't, or who had things, you know, who had things I wanted to absorb. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, the couple years I spent with Mike Ledbetter, I had to keep stepping it up because if I didn't, you know, it, it, you know, it wasn't like I was going to be left behind, but I felt like I would have been letting him down because he was putting so much out. Yeah. You know what I mean? And he was always getting better, man. He was always pushing him. Oh, he was, yeah. he was a student. Yeah. You know, by, yeah. by the end of it, you know, uh, you know, there was a gig that I couldn't do. And I told him, you know, you don't need to hire a guitar player for this thing. I would go see the Mike Ledbetter band right now if you were the only guitar player. Right. You know. Yeah. And he yeah. did, and he killed it. Yep. 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 And that dude, that's so that's a thing. That drive, you know, that. Yeah. <laughs> keeping it, you but you you have to cultivate it. You got to like keep it stoked. You know what I mean? To yep. To keep working on new things and pushing new things into your playing. I mean, how do you how do you make that happen for yourself? I think like I said, I mean I think I think some of it is surrounding myself with people who That's a great way. Whether or not they know whether or not they know it, they're demanding it of me. Yeah. Um yeah. And part of it is, you know, I'm always hearing something that I either I've never heard it before or I've heard it before and never thought about how to get it right. Or I'm like, I think I've been playing this wrong, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm always picking away at things like that. The danger with something like the pandemic is, I mean, the first danger is that you know, I just spend days without playing guitar at all mm-hmm. because it's there on the stand, but I'm doing whatever. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, the the danger is that I end up having to play a lot just to maintain the skill set. Yeah, I mean, the, there's you know, we take that for granted. The main the maintenance comes from playing gigs and playing every day and doing that. So yeah, you. you you have to spend time on now without those gigs just to keep things here when you really want right. to be moving like this all the time. So yeah, it's, right. it's, in some ways it takes extra effort now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm conscious of that. I'm conscious of um, making sure that I don't just sit around, you know, you know, playing the same stuff that I do uh you know that that I that I do play some things I haven't heard myself do before that I do listen to things you know yeah um and sometimes it's stupid stuff you know realizing that I have 
and this is something I haven't even done yet, but it's something that's been on my mind the last day or two. I have no fucking idea how to count the intro to drive my car. <laughs> you know. But it's weird where it starts. Um, and I'm going to have to figure out how to play it. And then I'm going to convince myself that's where it is so I can play it without having to go one, two, three, four. Here's the thing. Did you know in Smokestack Lightning, the bass is turned around? Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so I... One, two, three, four, one, two, three, yeah, four, yeah. one, you know. Some, and then, and, and, I, and every now and then, they will line up, and it's like, that's it, guys, that's it. But it's, the, right. it's, it's that it, it wasn't ever lined up is what makes that song sound like that, you know? Right. I, dude, but that's, that shit is the greatest. Like, I, you it's, know, it is. Every time I listen to things that I used to do, I, I, it's oh like, my God. what is he singing in this last verse? He never get. it's like, how does he not hear it? But yet it's the greatest thing ever, you know? Oh, it, it you know, I, I have done that song and... Uh, and like it's never been a consistent part of my repertoire but like when I'm playing with people we're just doing a gig I'm like oh I'll do that and and I'll start singing that last verse early and there's always someone in the band who's trying to be conscientious and like it goes with you. you know oh yeah it's like no don't do that what's crazy is you know they're they were tracking that live because I mean fuck that's mm -hmm. when it was how did he not hear the horns are going boom, 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 ba da do do? <laughs> he never caught yeah. it. I one of my favorite songs in history is "Blue and Lonesome" by Little Walter. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, with Luther Tucker playing guitar, and that's you know, the beginning of Tucker's whole. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but. Walter stops playing the harp solo after eight bars, which must be because Walter was such a consummate. Like, I mean, Walter thought like a jazz musician. Yeah. Walter must've been trying to like, tr you know, cut the song short to be on a 45 or something. Something but like that. Apparently half the band didn't know that. Cause then when the vocals come back, it's like five over one. It's a quick mm -hmm. four. So four. And yeah. then, you know, yeah. And then it's four over five. It's and it's this beautiful sound, but it's clearly a mistake. It's yeah that clearly. takes way longer to rectify than you think it would. Yeah, yeah, yeah but man, it's, it's uh, there's so much. I and, mean, and even I don't. He, and and the funny thing, I don't think of it as a mistake because that's the way the record sounds, and I love that record. But you know it is. <laughs> but yeah, you know. Yeah. Like, like I would never ever think of the times BB King comes in singing in the weird spots, you know, as a mistake. It is, but fuck, you could put BB King, uh, see, you could drop oh, I don't think, anywhere, and it doesn't matter. I know? don't, I don't think that's the case. I think he's holding for applause. <laughs> Sometimes it's maybe. always after the solo where he comes back in. You know, and he sings the first I've been downhearted baby halfway into the second four chord yeah. and then somehow manages to cram in all the lines. Oh, yeah. he catches up. He always catches up. Absolutely. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. Yep. Uh, all right. Number 10. Uh, okay, cool. Do you, do you have a five year plan? Where do you want to be in five years, man? Is it just <laughs> keep on keeping on alive? Yeah, alive. Besides, besides alive and not, you know, pandemic, you know, whatever. I don't know. I was in such a state of limbo uh, this whole last year. Um, for people who don't know, my musical partner was a singer named Mike Ledbetter, yeah. um, who's probably the greatest vocalist the blues has produced in this century. Um, You're not going to get an argument and, out of me. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean the fact that he had that skill set and wanted to use it doing, you know, like he really wanted to do West side Chicago blues, <laughs> you know? So, I mean, it was this perfect environment for me and we were doing really well. And then he passed away in January, 2019. 
and you know i'm still dealing with the grief of missing my friend sure um that's gonna be that's gonna be years but also like i didn't know what i was doing before the pandemic hit like i started thinking about maybe you know actually i was talking to people about putting out a monster michael welch record i had massive writer's block uh so that wouldn't have happened for a while anyway um and you know i mean i have musicians i love playing with but going out and being a sideman really wasn't it's something i love doing but kind of wasn't where my head was i mean i kind of had it in my head that i had my band doing our thing right and the blessing of playing with Mike is that I didn't have to change anything about the way I played. It didn't matter, you know, even when it would be more of a soul song or more of a straight up blues song or whatever. Um, the position my guitar held in that band was duet singer, you know, so I could mm -hmm. constantly be snaking around his voice. If I wanted to hang back and play rhythm, I hung back and played rhythm because playing rhythm is awesome. But it wasn't like I had to hold down this part and then I would step out and be the stunt guitar player for 24 bars and then step yeah. back. You know how that is. Yeah, you know, absolutely. That yeah. can be really rewarding when the music's good, but coming off of something where it had been this uh, intense creative partnership that was just pushing both of us higher, it's very hard to go back to... Yeah, to being the guy just takes 24 bars and, and go back, and step in those, backwards. And, you know, in those cases, I think, you know, that kind of sideman work, I think it's the soloing I dislike more than the playing rhythm. It's not that I want to be out there soloing. You yeah. know, I want to be part of making great music, but, yeah. you know. Yep. Step, yeah. You know, getting, getting like, you've got 12 bars to do this. Yeah. Versus, yeah. like playing it where I feel it. I don't know. Exactly. No, that's a hundred percent, you know, I, and I don't do it as much as I used to anymore, but that was one of the things about right. being a side man. The st those moments when they give you your shine, you know, and Oh, get out there and do your little thing. They were the least favorite parts of being the side man. And everybody thinks it, it should be the opposite. You're, you're relishing right. those moments. Well, yeah, but when you're really an improviser, I, I've spent my life having those moments so those little ones can never be they don't mean anything it's like i can't right. say anything at all instead i'm having to right. just go try to get house really for my boss you know what i mean right and so right. It's, it's not the same yeah yeah so yeah. so you know my five-year plan would be like in 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 a pandemicless world where where everything was hopefully better than normal if not just back to normal right. um year 1 would be figure out what the fuck i'm doing and mm. years uh 2 through 5 would be taking that ball and running with it mm -hmm. yeah you know what i mean um well you'll find it man you'll find it we're still young uh, i'm yeah <laughs> Uh, in in blues years, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> hey man, I f I feel all right. I feel all right. I, you know, I'll be forty one in a few yeah. days, but whatever. Yeah, yeah. Age it's, is just a number. Yeah, I just hit forty one. Well, you know, it's uh, you know, it's it's not like I always felt that great at twenty either. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I mean, I'm I'm, I, you know, I'm I'm a better player now i've got my shit together yep you know i, can't yep. I feel the same way that. i feel the same way i'm i'm getting better every day and you know whether i ever release something that all of a sudden changes my life you know i don't know if that will happen but i've lived a, a good life already i've done nothing but yeah. play guitar i'm fortunate for that i've got a family that loves me uh you know yep. i've got a studio i've got a life it could be way fucking worse <laughs> could be so much worse yep, yep. You know? yeah not not it not everyone comes out of the uh you know and i put this in quotes the teen prodigy years with as much you know yeah 
yeah. with, with as with as much to not just to show for it because that's the wrong term, but with you know, not as many even come out strength on the other side. musicians. Right, that's true. That was amazing. Every time I see Derek, because of everybody our <laughs> age around that generation, Derek, I was the closest to him because we were in Florida and we saw each other right. a lot. And every time we talk, that's the biggest takeaway is like, okay, you know, he's had more success doing his own thing maybe than I have. But just the the big aspect picture is look at this 30 years later, basically. We've never yep. done anything but this. That's pretty fucking awesome just right. in its own right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. No, it's a, uh, it, it's it's great. It's great to see that. Yeah. yeah. You know. Well, dude, that's it. We reached the end of the ten questions. Cool. Thank you. Awesome. And uh, for Thanks members, for, doing this. for members, hang on. We'll do a turn two video. And if you're not a member, this button here, join. Hit that button. Become a member because you're missing out on a lot of stuff. Or at least subscribe. But Anyways, we will have links to all things Mike Welch, Monster Mike, in the description of awesome. this video. So anything you want to promote, Mike, we will promote the fuck cool. out of it. And uh, thank you for doing this and for taking the time out of your day, man. Oh, man, it's uh, it's such a blast. I, uh, you know, I, I, I feel like you and I, as, as much as we've been sort of on parallel paths and occasionally intersected, we haven't gotten nearly as much chance to hang no. as I always wanted to, so... Same, same, man. So I hope that's coming more in the future that we actually get to do yeah, some definitely. playing and hanging. All right. Yeah, All right, members. I'd love to do that. Hang on. We'll be right back. Cool.